so guys, we need to speak very close to the mic, maybe like that. Oop, maybe that's too close. Okay. There? There. Okay. Well, let's uh, kick off this session. This is the second session of today. Uh, quite excited to be here. My name is Sebastian Sa. I'm the Associate Director of Agriculture Research at the Almond Board. And today I'm going to be playing uh, two roles. I'm going to be wearing two hats. I, I get to be the moderator of today's session of how your trees work and their adequate water supply and deficit supply. And I also get to be the first speaker. So voila, I'm going to be moderating myself. I'll see how I do that part. Um, anyhow, uh, when we were putting together this session, we were discussing how we could get the best out of it. And we decided that it was a good idea to split it perhaps in two parts. The first part of today's uh, session, where myself and Matthew Sawoninski, the professor from UC, from UC Davis, will be talking about uh, fundamental knowledge and how, and how that knowledge of how your trees work uh, can increase your way to use, can increase the, the tools that you have in the toolbox as a horticulture. So we're really gonna go dive into how trees work from a horticulture point of view and how our management affects them. Uh, of course, water, but also other type of management. Um, this uh, is, a, is a knowledge that, I, from my end, I learned when I was doing a PhD at UC Davis, and I got the opportunity to collaborate a lot with Dr. Bruce Lantin and Ted Dion, Patrick Brown, and then when I was a professor in Chile, I was able to continue that with six lines for four years. So then after that session, after the first half, we're going to move to uh, perhaps a more practical uh, component of the talk, where Meg Columber, the farm advisor from uh, Fresno County, and Luke Meron from the north, uh, farm advisor from the University of California, A&R, will be talking about their practical experience of what they saw this season in terms of irrigation and the, and the challenge that they encountered. So with that said, let's uh, kick off this meeting. So now I'm gonna wear my speaker hat and I'm gonna start presenting. So. I'm gonna talk about understanding sustainable yield. Uh, what it takes to a tree and what management does it take to produce a given amount of pounds. And to that end, I always like to start my talk with the question that you see here. What are the factors that define almond yield in a given season? Anybody, any guess? What are the factors that define almond yield in a given season? I'll give you a hint here, okay? That's a little bit of a hint, it has a lot of white, what will you say? Flowers. Yep. So flowers definitely is an important factor. And it's actually one of the three main drivers or the three factors that explain how many pounds we're going to produce in a given season. The second one is percentage of fruit sets. Some of you may have been thinking about that one. And the third one is the kernel weight. And the beauty, and my invitation right now is as you walk your orchards, uh, always try to think about these three factors and what, how your management affects each of them. So, because you can actually arrange these three factors and you get what is, what is called the yield potential equation. So the maximum amount of pounds that you will produce in a given season is equal to the number of flowers times the percentage of fruit set times kernel weight. So if you are an optimistic grower here in this room and you are trying to, you are shooting for 4,000 pounds per acre with a good caliber, meaning about 28, um, 28 kernels per ounce, that translates to about 0 0.0022 pounds per kernel, then you're probably looking into a percentage of fruit set of 28%. And that translates then to about 6.5 million flowers per acre. So yeah, it's a lot of flowers. There's, so it's not coincidence that we like pictures that like that and, that and that we need to be careful and we need to think about those flowers and where they come and how they work. So what I will do next, I will walk you through these three components and, and how uh, the rationality behind them and how we can improve them. So let's start by the number of flowers. When I think about the number of flowers, I think about it as a game of number, but also a, a game of quality. Because it's not only important to have a lot of flowers, how I was showing you just before, but it's also important that those flowers are healthy and fertile because otherwise they're not gonna set fruit. So need to keep those two aspects in mind. To, to know more about that, so how to play the game and how to win this game, we need to know from where those flowers come. And flowers in almond, in mature almond trees, are produced in a 
uh, short, short, short shoots no longer than two inches called spurs. Almond spurs are the fundamental breed units in almonds. Uh, here you can see an almond spur in this picture. Uh, it has, it's a short shoot, compacted shoot. It takes about two years to form and it has lateral buds there that will uh, produce flowers and a vegetative bag in the middle that would allow it to continue to survive through the year. So that's how it kind of like look, that's how um, when they pop, it looks like that at the beginning of bloom. A lot of spurs there, and then as the season progresses, you can see one of those spurs right there with one fruit and their leaves and its leaves. And, and that's what is really important. That's almond spurs, and are, again, are compacted shoots no longer than two to three inches at mature trees, produce about 80% of their total yield in these structures. And it takes a while for the tree to put this structure, to form this structure. First, the branch has to go grow, then the spur has to mature, and then it can set fruit. So you're talking about an investment of two years to develop in spurs or more. So I think with that basic knowledge that, that you know now that fruit, flowers, everything comes from this, uh, it's, it's bearing the spurs, you may be thinking that, well, I got it. Ideally, we would like to have as many spurs as possible and many, as many of them flowering and bearing fruit. So who wouldn't like to have a sequence like that one? Beautiful spurs popping and then uh, flowering and a lot of fruit set. Well, the research that we have observed that we have done in this area shows that a significant amount of these spurs will die or not bloom from one season to another. So, um, and what I try, the way I try to illustrate this is uh, it's imagine, imagining that you are walking your orchard in the middle of the season. So a few months ago, you're walking your orchard and you observe a spurs like that one in your orchard. That before harvest, they have one fruit. And what happened with those spurs at the following year is that they are going to go into a process called alternate bearing. They're going to go into an off year. So they will go from having fruit to not having fr fruit. So that is another big concept, another big concept of knowledge, because now I think you understand that you have that the ones that are producing fruit this season are the ones that are responsible for the amount of funds that you're going to get the current season. But at the following year, those fruits are going to be resting. So uh, you have to start looking uh, into as you walk your orchards now, I think you not only have to look for the ones that have fruit, you have to look the ones that do not have fruit because those ones are gonna, be, are gonna be the ones that are responsible for next year yield. So whew, I think that's a superpower. Now when you are looking and walking through your orchards, you're not only looking to the fruiting spurs, but you're gonna start looking into the non-fruiting spurs and you have a sense of what's going on this season and also what will happen next season. So another piece of information here, it's that, uh, that these spurs, when they uh, tend to set multiple fruit, they tend to die. Um, so you can see that uh, in this picture where you see a two fruiting spurs, this is what I call the black widow phenomenon, where the fruiting spurs drag the energy and the nutrients uh, of the nearby leaves and actually at the following year it's dead. So poof, another big set of information here. Now you know that you have spurs that will die, spurs that will survive but will be resting. So now you need to start thinking how to manage your tree so you don't see this phenomena at the acre level or at the tree level. You have to control for this and keep it in balance so you actually can have sustainable yield over and over, good yields over and over. And so, um, and to do that, I think it's important to recognize these three spur populations. The non-fruiting spurs, the ones that are resting today, are probably gonna be the responsible ones for the next year's yield. While these ones uh, are your, perhaps your short-term investments, where uh, are the ones that are responsible for this year's yield will be either dead or, or resting the next year. So if they are dying, we also need to be thinking about renewal rates, about population of spurs that are growing, uh, new growth that will be, indi uh, will be an indicator of new future spurs. So my invitation to you here is thinking of, of abundance, of a lot of fruit set, a lot of flower, as a balancing act between different spur populations. Take care of all of them and walk your orchards and learn how to identify these different spur populations. When you are walking, think about the rate of spurs. You need to, the rate of spurs being formed needs to overcome the rate of spurs that are dying. So check for new growth. 
Um, your current yield largely depends on the spurs with fruit, and your next year yield will largely depend on the spurs without fruit. So now that we have these pieces of information, perhaps basic knowledge, let's see how we as horticulturists, grower, pomologists, etc., we can influence these spurs populations. And I brought a couple of examples here. First one, nutrient. So here you can see, for instance, zinc deficiency. Zinc deficiency will reduce the length of the shoot, will have shorter internodes, and if you reduce the, the length of the shoot, then you have less area to grow new spurs. So at the end of the day, you are reducing the number of new spurs. So that's how uh, uh, perhaps the detrimental effects of the nutrient deficiency is not only because you won't have that much in healthy at uh, capturing enough light, etc. It will be smaller, so you will reduce potentially your your spur population. Here's another example: whole rot. Many of you probably well familiar with whole rot. This uh, fungal disease, by a complex of pathogen, could be monilia uh, that enters into the fruit when it's open uh, during whole split and releases a toxin, and that toxin kind of like flies, uh, uh, moves backward to the phloem up to a yard back behind that the same shoot, and it kills the spur that has that fruit, and also kills the spurs nearby. So it accelerates this process that I was telling you of a spur's death. So if you have a lot of fruit and you have a lot of whole rot, then you are actually killing a lot of spurs potentially, which could translate into a whole three phenomena of alternate bearing and a whole acre phenomena of alternate bearing, meaning a year of high yield and a year of low yield. You don't want to fall there. If you have good management, you should not fall there. And good management means to actually apply nutrients and water with the right amount. We published the uh, four hours of plant nutrition for AMOS, an extension document that you can find in our booth. And we have extensive information about water to, to actually avoid uh, situations like the one I'm describing here. Another example. Irrigation, perhaps to what it brings us today, uh, or one of the, the, the trending topics today. I think irrigation has actually an effect all year round. All year round because in the early in the season, in the spring, you will affect canopy size. We know that if you irrigate with a deficit irrigation or excessive stress, if the stress, occur, stress occurs in the trees, they are going to grow less. If they grow less, similarly to how I was showing you in uh, the zinc example, they will have a smaller populations of spurs. So be careful with irrigation all year round. You can think about in a, uh, of the effect in a spring as the long-term effect is going to affect your populations in future years. But then also it has a short-term effect, which probably many of you experienced this season, which is uh, a reduction in kernel size. And we have quantified this over and over. Pure irrigation equals smaller kernels. Um, then also, late in the summer, right after harvest or when you're about to harvest, those flower buds that you see in February are being actually formed and differentiated during that harvest period. Uh, and so during this flower formation, which we call differentiation of the, of the buds, uh, water has something to do on it. It also affects this. So another effect of, of, of the water in the flower formation. And then as you move even move forward, Leaf senescence, and uh, we, we know that many of you will, uh, will stress the trees to, to have a, an efficient harvest, and then they maybe have a hard time putting wa water back on. If that is the case, then you, it's unlikely to see pictures like the one I'm showing you, where you have trees after harvest that are somehow green becoming yellow. And they don't become yellow because of random, because it's not random, they become yellow because that green color is the chlorophyll that gets transported from the leaves to the spurs. So it helps to build that storage, that energy. And if we, quote unquote, mess it up we, and, 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 and check the trees and then drop all those leaves and there is not what I call a uh, good leaf senescing process, the, the healthy component of the flowers will go down for the following season. So again, four cases how irrigation management affects uh, your uh, spur population and ultimately all, uh, your yield. One of, some of them short term, other ones long term. But enough about, about flowers and spurs. Let me talk now a little bit about percentage of fruit set. And perhaps the, the, the key message that I bring here is to start thinking about fruit set beyond flowering, okay? During flowering is when fruit sets begin. 
and and I, I hear over and over that we tend to think too much about the flowering component and fruit set at that point, and we forget that it's a process that continues to occur for the few months after. In our California conditions, usually by the end of April or end of May, uh, first week of May, you will have what is called final fruit set. So while you have to think about flowering at the beginning as the initial fruit set, then there will be natural drops that I'm going to touch in a second that will, that will, that will result in a final fruit, fruit set uh, by the end of April of, uh, of, of first week of May. So start thinking about fruit set of this process that starts somewhere in February and somewhere in the first week of May and that we have something to say about it or to manage for. So during bloom, during, let's, uh, during actual bloom, there are a couple of horticulture management that we have studied and that uh, we know that influence uh, uh, fruit set. One of them we cannot control so much unless we select the lo right location, etc. will be weather. So I will leave that one apart. But there are other ones, like the ones you can see here on the screen, that we can definitely control and we can definitely manage them for optimum yield. So flower quality, the work that Dr. Samoninsky does in carbohydrates have illustrated that that's a critical component as well. And we know from the previous work from Dr. Patrick Brown that nutrients such as boron and zinc play a key role either in the elongation of the pollinic tube or in the uh, uh, formation of the, antera, of the pollen and in, in the antera sacs. So critical for, healthy, uh, for good, good fruit set to have good healthy flowers and we can help with different management there. Adequate cross-pollination between the variety and pollinizers also essential. And I like uh, to illustrate that, that with the, sorry, with there's acknowledgement there, with this picture from Joe Connell, uh, where you can see the wrong selection of the pollinizer. You can see how a pollinizer is way ahead, the one, one already bloom and leaf out, and the other one is just blooming. So if we don't have a good cross-pollinization in non-self-compatible varieties, that's not gonna work. Um, then the number of uh, hives also, uh, the, sorry, the number of frames per hive. It is not the same to have hives that have nine frames that are able to send workers out of their hive and keep that temperature inside to keep them healthy. Uh, it's not the same as having four frames where the, those hives are not gonna be flying because they will get too cold. They need to be inside, so they are not gonna have workers outside. So a lot of management that we can do to improve fruit set. Um, here, the percentage of fruit set as affected after, after bloom uh, I would like you to keep in mind the natural fruit drops of almonds. There are three distinct stage, stages uh, of fruit drop, the first of which is shortly after bloom, when defective flowers fall from the tree. The second one drops occurs a month later with pea-sized flowers, mostly unpollinized fall. Um, and the third one is the final drop, so it's what it calls the, the load adjustment, and occurs in almonds about six to seven weeks after bloom. And I think in this one, it's, uh, it's where we can, by our management, we can, we can affect and we can reduce as much as possible. Because there is a combination of factors that affect the third fruit drop. Uh, some of them, again, I think we can control. Others, not so much like weather, if it's super cloudy days, in, um, uh, maybe that will play us against us. But while we don't have so many studies, research studies in this area, we have observational data that shows that poor fertigation, water apply in excess, will actually increase fruit drop, this adjustment. The tree will say, oh my gosh, I need to adjust. I cannot hold this uh, fruit for the whole season. We don't want the tree to think that. So let's uh, make sure that that doesn't happen. Uh, and the other aspect, uh, it, of course, is correlated with fruit set. If, we ha if, if it's, you have a very high fruit set at the beginning, you will also tend to have a higher uh, load adjustment. So practical tip here. Walk your orchards once again and check some branches with your hand in late April, a beginning of May. Go there, check them, and if and start to get a feeling. Uh, do it in your different blocks, your different varieties every year, and you will see that some years that is more uh, you have higher fruit drop than others. And in those years, uh, try to understand. It's at the end there is not a single answer. Try to understand what are the site specific factors that that may have resulted in a either higher or lower fruit drop. Uh, fruit drop, and it's that knowledge that is going to help you to take better and smarter decisions in the seasons to come. Okay, very quickly about kernel kernel way. 
let's move forward in time. Let's think that we went through flowering, we went through fruit drops, we have final fruit set, and now the game really becomes a, 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 a game of the number of fruit left on the tree times the size of the individual kernel. And I think here is when your efforts in a spring start to pay off. Here is where really, uh, if you did things well and the tree was able to grow and cover its space, uh, the adequate management will result in a, what is called a strong light harvesting machine. Remember that the process is beautiful. The trees are covering their space, they are capturing the sunlight, and they are capturing that energy into the kernels that we eat. Uh, so let's the tree do that. Let's the help the tree to grow, to cover that space, but also make sure that once it's there, it's functional. Once you have that equipment, the hardware, that has to be working. And for the tree to be working, it needs to be to receive adequate water, adequate nu nutrients, and also it needs an integrated pest management approach because you need a healthy tree as well. So that's how you need to start thinking about uh, kernel size. And I would say it's not coincident effort that we like to take pictures in orchards like this one that look that they have in the middle of the summer more than 80 to 85 percent of the their light intersection. Oops, sorry. Um, and this is the result of Dr. Bruce Lampinen, where he has uh, walked through many orchards uh, uh, over season over season and, and really quantified that the most productive orchards, or at least the orchards that has the biggest potential to set uh, fruit or more pounds per acre, are those ones that reach about 80, 85% of light interception in the middle of the summer. Another practical example, walk your orchard during the middle of the summer, look at the shade, see how much uh, light is actually going, you don't want too much, start to get a sense, I'm sure you can get pretty good at it. So I end from what I started, I end with the yield potential equation and a few tips. Number of flowers, remember different sparse populations, take care of all of them, keep them in balance. Percentage of fruit set, expand your vision. Don't only think about percentage of fruit set during bloom, think until uh, the final fruit set occurs, which is the first week of May. And kernel wave, um, well, Make sure that you are, in, are, are allowing the tree to do its work. If, you're, if you did it well at the beginning, the canopy size grew correctly, then the, that, ca that canopy size needs to be harvesting light as efficient as possible. For us, a good NPM approach, following the four hours of plant nutrition that we have in our booth, will help you out. That's what I brought for today. And with that, I want to acknowledge the people that have worked in this section, uh, in this area for many years, more than me, Bruce Lampin, Ted Dion, Patrick, Emilio, Mache, uh, many of them before I started working in this area, and then my former collaborations when I was in Chile uh, as a professor. Thank you. So, as I mentioned, now it was Dr. Mache Sawoninski, professor from the University of California, Davis, he has a very interesting approach to understand how tree works from the carbohydrate point of view. We have been supporting that line of research, and he also has new projects in terms of how irrigation management could affect carbohydrates or vice versa. Um, so uh, with that said, let, let me welcome Max. Thank you, Sebastian. <clears throat> so uh, I got 15 minutes, although when I start to prepare my talk today, I mean, repeat my talk today morning after four slides. I was already 25 minutes into it. So uh, I will be probably kicked out of this scene at this stage soon. But I would like to thank the, my collaborator, Paula Guzman, who is running the Carbohydrate Observatory that produces most of the data. So what I would like to talk today is just introduce photosynthesis, talk about carbohydrates, which is this energy that Sebastian was talking about, and then talk about how the NSC affects, uh, NSC, these are just carbohydrates, not non-structural carbohydrates, how they affect phenology, yield, and then provide some conclusions and show what is the work, I mean, how the process of work goes forward, I mean, learning process. So to remember, 99% of plant material is built out of uh, three elements, and these are carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, and those three elements, they form carbohydrates. And 95% that we see, like you look at the tree, all the wood, everything is constructed out of those three elements. Very few other elements in the, you know, when you burn wood, there is only a little bit of dust that is left over it, it's other elements. So how do they get into the plant? Of course, they get in there by photosynthesis. And photosynthesis is the process by which plant acquire those two things. And plant 
opens stomata, those little pores in the leaves, the CO2 gets in and water goes out and plant gets about one molecule of uh, carbon fixed into the system with about 200 mo molecules of water lost into the atmosphere. And by the way, it does use, the plant does use one molecule of water from this 200 to, to attach to the, to the carbon, to, to get the carbohydrates, which are right here. So carbohydrates are this energy stored in the bonds and they are used as an energy source to protect tree and to do other stuff. And also they are being used to produce, to, to, to form the structure. So plant has this capacity to use carbohydrates to maintenance, growth, defense, and reproduction. And you can see it here. You have photosynthesis. They produce soluble sugars, and those soluble sugars go to respiration, growth, defense, and reproduction. And also, I didn't put it yet here because I don't know how to measure it accurately. They also go underground and produce soil. I mean, they, they release carbohydrates to the soil, providing the, a lot of energy for the microbe interaction and so on. So they, they, they really provide this they make their own habitat in, by using those soluble carbohydrates. So carbohydrates are being produced only when there is the uh, when there is the sun, and during night they don't. So they have to have some reserves to survive the night. This is what we call kind of those reserves, energy reserves. They have to stay there for 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 the periods of no photosynthetic, uh, lack of photosynthesis, and especially during the dormancy. If there is no leaves, there is also no photosynthesis, so they have to do it. They have to store it somehow. Non-structural carbohydrates, this is what these two things are, soluble sugars and starch, are this kind of liquid acids of plant. This is what plant has. Once it uses it, it's gone. So if it's used for growth, there is no more carbohydrates. Plant cannot take out any energy from lignin back to the plant. So it's just, it's a, it's a lost, or not lost, from the perspective of plant, it's an investment, but it's also a lost cash because that's how I see the carbohydrates, it's a cash. And uh, it flows around the tree. So tree serves, like sends this cash all over the tree to, to, to fruits, to, 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 to roots and so on, to, to pay for everything. And the respiration is one thing that it's important because this is lost to the atmosphere. About 50% of carbohydrate is lost back to the atmosphere as a CO2 because plant has to maintain to be alive. So it has to stay alive. And starch, whenever during a day it produces too much sugars plant due to the photosynthesis, it, it stores it in the starch, form of starch, because starch is like an invisible, it's like fat in humans. Is that we accept, we get it, and we don't know how much we have it unless we look into the mirror or step on the balance. But uh, plant doesn't have those two things, so it never knows how much starch it has, so it assumes it has enough, but it doesn't, then there is a problem. But this is something like a, like a saving account for plant. So NSC levels has to be maintained to allow trees to survive and, and uh, recover from non-photosynthetic periods. After dormancy, as, as Sebastian was saying, they have to bloom. And if they don't have energy to bloom, or they will not bloom and there will be no flowers. So that's, that's a very important part to remember. So what we do as managers of the, of the orchards, we have this, we, most of our actions are really focused on photosynthesis meaning we irrigate, we fertilize, we provide plants with everything to, for plants to open stomata, produce the green tissue, and produce photosynthates. The other part, so once the photosynthesis is there, there is this expenses that plant has, and often we try to help plant to reduce those expenses, especially defense, by providing the protection from pathogens, from insects and other diseases. If we provide it, then there is no need for plant to try to protect itself, because it spends a lot of energies Plants spend a lot of energy for protecting themselves. They produce isoprene. They produce a lot of things that are used to defend the, the, the plant from the pathogens. So we, we have those two, basically two elements. We can, in fact, use defense, <coughs> sorry, protect it from, from loss of carbohydrates for defense, and we can try to produce enough of carbohydrates for the plant. Can we also learn something, or how do we do it just trying to study the carbohydrates. Can we affect carbohydrates independently of those two things? That's what I try to study in my research. But anyway, so we do those two things and plant, uh, we hope that this our effort, we produce higher yield. And there is a problem with it because respiration, this part here, we have no effect of, on it because it is a temperature dependent and we really don't 
have a chance to change it. So if there is a too high temperatures, they respire more because it's a function of the temperature. And we are lucky in, in California because at, at that times of no photosynthetic activity, I mean, no photosynthesis at night, usually there is a delta breeze and then it's temperature drop. So from 25 degrees to 15 degrees C, if there is a drop, there is a two times less energy being wasted for respiration. I'm not wasted, used for respiration. But if the temperature at night is higher, automatically we lose more energy for respiration and there is less energy available for everything else. Uh, then we have the growth function. I mean, we lose something to growth and usually we have no, we, we don't affect it. The plant grows as it wants to. If it, there is a space, it will grow there. So we waste those, uh, not waste, but we use those energy, those resources for growth. And we usually don't have it, but people already tried by producing, not necessarily in almond, but they try to, for example, for apples and so on, they try to do the dwarfing uh, plants because they smaller plants they say oh we use less energy for growth so we, we put more energy into the plants into the fruits or for example girdling when people girdle the stems they try to uh, stop I don't know what it was uh, so then then the, uh, the the girdling it stops flowing sugars out of the stem of the branches so we believe like people believe that it will stay in the branch and you know it will be more available for for the for the fruits, and then there is also investment in the which are we are most interested in. It's the investment in the oops, wrong time. Ah. Right behind. Hmm. Sorry. Sorry. Red. Oh. No, I don't know where we are. All right. So, uh, and, and at the end, we have the flowers, so investment in flowers. So investment in reproduction is something that Sebastian is saying, plant at the end, it will invest in reproduction. And those, those, all those investments here, they are kind of competing with each other. And uh, they compete depending on how much water they have and what plant is performing in the field. So what do we know about the, about the investment and how it goes? Interestingly, those, CO, those, nice, those not, uh, carbohydrates in the plant, they are not being, uh, we can observe them and measure them throughout the season. And you can see this is like a seasonal one year pattern and distribution of carbohydrates, those, this cache inside the, the plant between different elements of plant. And you can see that most of it, it is in the, in, in the after July, it accumulates a lot in the, in the, in the, in the spur bearing, uh, I mean in spurs. Uh, in the, the spur bearing stem, and then it maximizes just before the leaf drop in October, and then it's being used over winter. But that's where the, what Sebastian was saying, this is where the flowers are being formed, and that's where the most of energy is being stored, and most likely used in the spring to push those buds out. And so the Carbohydrates Observatory at Iran uh, analyzed this pattern for years to establish some kind of a timeline of, and, and the repetition of it every year, this time series, that we can later on predict or understand what parameters of the environment influence this process. And you can see here there is this pattern every year, it's followed every year, and then you can see that there is a winter white one, then there is a vegetative part, then there is a uh, yield, and this is the uh, fall, and then, I mean, this is the, the, the time when you collect the crop, and there's the fall, and then the winter again. And you can see that there is an accumulation before winter of all the carbohydrates, and there is a drop during spring, and during winter due to the respiration when there is no photosynthesis and then there is a spring and then there is a very minimum level during summer so basically when leaves providing carbohydrates plant maintains low carbohydrates and serves all the other needs and then at the, before the winter it goes up again and so on so there is a winter loss summer minimum and fall why am i saying it because it's important to understand how plant operates later on in the so it's also changes during the time, it changes for having this cash in hand and, and savings, like on which is starch and sugar. And in the winter, you can see on this particular slide that in the winter, it's mostly the blue one here. It is the starch and in the winter, it has more starch and less sugar. And then in the summer, in the, in the before summer, it has more sugar and less starch. So it's kind of switches where it keeps the energy for the moment. So what do we know? How does it influence? Does it really have met, does it really influence the yield? And yes, what we found is that those red dots here, I mean the red boxes here, you can see in the, in the here too, 
Because red boxes, there's a highly significant correlation between collected from about 500 orchards, different age, different uh, different management, and everything different on the, about them. But it's so this is uh, the scatter is large, but despite it, it still shows a very strong and very highly significant trend that higher amount of carbohydrates in February or in January, higher amount of carbohydrates leads to higher yield. It's about one milligram of carbohydrates in the stem per 30 pounds of uh, almond in the, in the, in the, per acre. So it's, it's very strong and it's about one milligram of more sugar in the, in, the, in the sugar in the wood, which is in the sap, it leads to much higher, about 70 pounds per acre, higher, uh, higher uh, yield. Interestingly, in May, we have an opposite situation and also in, the, in August. In May, the more than use, so this is a negative correlation, the more they use, the more than the, the, the more uh, the higher production. So they kind of like switch. If they, they take the risky approach, if they have a lot in February, they produce a lot of flowers, if they use more, they can, they can produce more. So there's a, they take a risk saying, okay, I'm provided by manager of the orchard with everything I need. I can take a risk and produce more by using more carbohydrates. So I, need to, I don't need to store them. And this is important for the spring. This is why you can explain the Feb January and February, because you can see this is starch below the flower, and this is starch, the, the lack of starch near the flower. So once starch bloom, once flower bloom, it uses all the energy that was in the stem. So high January amount of sugars leads to healthy flower. In, and then high yield would be associated with high taking, risk taking. Basically expend all the energy I have to provide to the, to the to the to the fruits, I will have a you know I will reduce the drop probably in May, and then in, if I invested a lot, I have less in the August. But I have to recover in the fall. So after after the time, the plant has to recover for the next season. It has to recover all the all the all the system here. There is another little thing that I put in is that carbohydrates. Sorry. Uh, that carbohydrates has also influence the impact has an impact on uh, on the amount of carbohydrates in the spring has a very high impact on how plant perceives the temperature in the winter so chilling hours and so on and also whether it will bloom in a uh, synchronous and 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 and, and a synchronous way and then at, the, at the right time and whether flowers will be healthy and we can discuss it if you are, somebody's interested after the talk uh, so what we what what the, at, at the end what we can do about it and what is the how I think that this uh, research provides what hypothesis so we have this winter bloom and the initial reserves and uh, high initial reserves in winter affects bloom and they also affect the yield and what we can do about it we have to think about it how plants can accumulate the carbohydrates in the fall how we can get this to uh, how we can increase the, decrease the respiration, like maybe whitening the bark, or how we can uh, protect plants from uh, to losing too much carbohydrates, or uh, how we can uh, help plants co collect enough carbohydrates in the fall by maybe maintaining a certain level of uh, like limited irrigation that stops any kind of growth or expansion of stem, but forces accumulation of carbohydrates. In the summer, we look for trees that are taking this risk. So we look for the management that promotes the plants to take the risk. So we remove all the probably all the uh, problems related to stress in the plant. And uh, in the and the, this is post harvest. I already kind of measured, told about it during the winter part. But we we allow plants to recover post management post harvest management for carbohydrates might be a key to see how they. Uh, you know, how to improve the future yield. And that's probably, okay, that there is a science in it. And I have one minute, so I do just thank you. Thank you, Mate. Uh, definitely a zoom in into how trees work. And as you were seeing in my previous talk, how we can take that knowledge into some practical tips. And that's why we're going to move even more now to zoom out, out a little bit. And May is going to share with us her experience, uh, that what she has seen in Fresno County and uh, in terms of irrigation management and perhaps some challenge or two, uh, one or two challenges about it. Thank you, May. 
Thank you, Sebastian. Okay, so as Sebastian said, um, you know, I want to just give some more practical observations that, 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 that I noticed this last year from, from the southern San Joaquin Valley. And so, uh, first off, it's just the graph demonstrating in the Sierras um, above the San Joaquin River drainage, it's just this uh, for 40 years of, of precipitation data, and those last two marks um, show what the what the precip levels were uh, 20, 2019 going into 2020 and then 2020 going into 2021. So um, coming into this year, two, two, level, two years of um, very low levels of precipitation. And as everyone knows, uh, this uh, led into uh, close to zero water allocation for this year. Um, towards, towards the end of this season, um, I, I was getting a lot of calls from people, uh, and uh, S Sebastian has mentioned this. Uh, a lot of people were noticing that the, they were having smaller nut sizes, um, maybe sometimes lower kernel weights, um, and trying to understand, you know, what what may have caused this this season. You know, um, and so first we may think, okay, uh, this may be attributed to the drought. But I I, I talked to people that both had water. Um, you know, adequate water, and then and then less water uh, with a similar outcome. So, um, so there there may be something more to this. So, um, this is just a, a graph showing uh, daily temperatures for for five points, and um, this is uh, you, you, for the thirty year average. You have what in the re the red line would be what the maximum temperatures for for that date would be. The blue line would be what those low temperatures are. And then those dark, the dark blue bars, the vertical bars, show what the temperatures were for for this season. And so, um, uh, just uh, hoping to build on, you know, some of this concept that 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 Matt, you was talking about with the importance of um, uh, of um, the tree generating carbohydrates, generating stores to help to produce the crop for the year. So we're seeing elevated temperatures, um, and I know it's probably hard to see on the on the, uh, on the on this lower axis, but um, you know this is the temperatures from from March 1st through through May 31st. So soon after bloom, you know early uh, after nut set, uh, we are already seeing these elevated temperatures. Um, and um, uh, David Dahl and the Almond Doctor has a has a nice write up, kind of talking about um, the, this potential relationship between drought um, and, and these elevated temperatures in the spring. So we think this may be a factor with what we were seeing um, with some of these smaller nut sizes. So um, when, when we have uh, above average temperatures um, in, in, in the spring, this is going to induce plant stress, uh, maybe uh, increased respiration, which may uh, you know, divert some of, the, some of that energy that's needed for photosynthesis. Um, and so this is going to uh, affect the ability to produce carbohydrates for, for plant growth, canopy growth, and, and that fruit development. And so, um, as, as David mentioned in, in, in his article, uh, some growers are reporting maybe um, 28 to 30 nuts uh, per ounce, as opposed to uh, maybe about like uh, what, what would be normal, around maybe 26. Um, so uh, early in the summer, uh, so thinking about these high temperatures that we saw early on, I got a lot of calls early on. My, my lower canopy is yellowing, you know, the leaves are already dying off and this was even, you know, end of May, maybe beginning of, of June this year. And so, um, you know, it's, it, this isn't unique to this year. You know, I think that this is something that, you know, I think a lot of farm advisors would say they talk with growers about seeing every year, but it seemed like it was a lot earlier. And so, um, you know, by my estimation, some of the likely causes of this could be a combination of factors related to the heat. So, you know, as we were talking about, you know, that the tree puts a, a, a needs a lot of those energy reserves for just the canopy growth. So maybe that maybe this is a response where the tree is compensating. Um, so it could be a could be related to heat and water stress, and then um, also, you know, in these perennial tree tops, a lot of what we see in terms of um, uh, a growth over time, it's, it's, there are compounding uh, factors. And so, you know, if we have a lot of canopy uh, over a long period of time, shading out, we start to see lower limb dieback. It, it can be in response to hull rot, like Sebastian mentioned, or, um, you know, there could be a number of factors, but a lot of that times that shading 
uh, humidity in the lower canopy. Um, a lot of times when I see orchards like this, um, we'll also see that there may be some problems with infiltration or ponding at the surface. So um, there could be some other, other sources of stress for the tree there leading to drip. Um, okay, so uh, the drought impacts on water supply. So when we have drought, um, obviously, uh, the, the amount of surface water availability goes down. We increase our reliance on groundwater, um, and that, can, the, that groundwater uh, can have varying levels of, of quality um, than, than what the, the orchard has been used to with the surface water. Um, if, even with the surface water in the canals, when we have decreased flow rates, um, we're going to see increases in temperature. Um, we're going to see elevated concentrations of salt. And then a lot of times um, with that increased temperature, we'll see um, uh, changes in the biological growths um, that we see in the water. Um, and so this, uh, this can, imp uh, so when, as we pump this into our, our irrigation system, this can affect our, our uh, you know, like how efficiently our filtration system works, what types of um, amendments maybe are appropriate to apply to, to control if you have biological problems or, or chemical precipitates problems. Um, so this can, this can affect our application rate, this can affect our distribution uniformity, and ultimately the amount of applied, applied water um, that, that the trees are getting um, throughout the season. So, um, so when we have these problems potentially with water quality, um, that's going to lead to some potential irrigation system problems. So these are pictures that I took this season. Um, our micro irrigation systems are highly efficient, but they have very small openings that are highly susceptible to clogging and leaks. Okay, so it's important um, because I, I think that, you know, anyone that, that, that walks a lot of orchards and everything, this, this is a common issue that you're gonna see. Um, and, you know, and additionally, there's other, you know, other sources of these problems with rodents and all of this, but, um, but and, and, um, invertebrate pests, uh, coyotes and so forth. But, um, but the, the clogging, I think, is, uh, is going to be a major factor. And so, um, you know, we're always kind of harping on this importance of um, doing an irrigation system evaluation and conducting routine maintenance. And so these graphs are uh, sort of try to illustrate why. Um, so here, if you have two fields where you have um, the DU evaluated, uh, a system e even with a 90% would be considered good um, efficiency. Um, you can get, a, you know, in a single irrigation set, maybe a difference of two tenths of an inch um, in a single set. A 70% DU, um, it could be seven tenths of an inch in, in a single irrigation. And so, um, you know, when we start to identify pro problem areas in the orchard, you know, like maybe, maybe some trees are looking weaker, um, you know, than others and trying to understand, you know, what, what's causing the spatial variability, um, the, the irrigation system itself could could be contributing to that. So some trees may be getting um, a lot more water than, 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 uh, than what's needed and some may be getting less. And so it's, it's, uh, you know, it's recommended that you keep on top of this and you do a professional system evaluation um, at least every two to three years. Um, and so just further illustrating that point, these are those same numbers. So you have um, here uh, what, in a single in a single application, what uh, in in the high quarter of the orchard, so the where you're getting the most um, output from your system, um, this would be what the water application would be for for a seventy to ninety percent DU, and then this would be the low quarter. So in a single in a single set, this would be the difference in your inches applied, but cumulatively over over the course of the season, that can be a significant difference in the amount of applied water. So something good to keep in mind. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, uh, drought, you know, is going to really drastically change, uh, potentially change the, the water, the quality of the water that's available to us. Um, and so, um, you know, if you're, if you're at the beginning of developing an orchard system, it's, it's good to, um, to, to, you know, but, to, to have a, a, a thorough assessment of your, of your water quality and understand what the particulate content of that for choosing your filtration system and choosing the, um, the uh, type of emitters that you're going to use. Again, organic contaminants, that's going to go up with increasing temperatures. Um, uh, you, 
on a standard uh, water quality assessment. You should have accounts of biologicals if you have a problem uh, with that. It, it needs to be addressed. Um, sometimes with chemical precipitates, if you have um, if you have elevated levels of iron or manganese in the water, um, these these that feeds uh, those those microbials, and so we need to um, to make these assessments probably at least once a year to make sure that we're we're properly treating the water and keeping keeping our irrigation system clean, and then um, you know and, and then also we, with uh, with with the degraded water quality, often we're seeing elevated levels of salts that we may not have seen before, even in surface water. Um, okay, well, thank you. Okay, so, um, you know, there's a lot of talk with salinity, so it's like you have to talk about drought and, and salinity goes with that. And, um, you know, I think there's often a lot of focus on maybe uh, west, west side, uh, water quality and things like that, where we talk about, you know, there being elevated sodium and imbalance of sodium to, to EC. But, um, you know, I talk, I talk to growers all over uh, on both sides of the county, and um, I would say that this is a pretty, a pretty typical um, water evalu evaluation for some east side uh, wells. And um, I know it's uh, too, too small to see, but, but in short, you know, what, what, I, what I've picked up, oops, what, what I might pick up on is that, you know, we typically see high pH. A lot of times there's high levels of bicarbonates, but there's low levels of EC, high levels of calcium, so the water's hard, but then there might be low levels of sodium and chloride. And so um, th it's important to, to, to be aware of, of how these elements of, of your water chemistry can affect um, how, how the water moves through your irrigation system. When you have high levels of pH, high levels of bicarbonate calcium, that creates conditions that tend towards uh, precipitation and clogging. Okay, so here's, here's a picture, recent picture, so you see a lot of the emitter clogging. So um, generally when you have those type of conditions, that would, uh, that would call for um, acid forming type amendments. Um, so, you know, maybe east side, maybe a lot of people are more accustomed to, you know, doing a gypsum slurry or applying a lot of gypsum, but um, when you apply more calcium to a system that already has a lot of calcium, high pH, high bicarbonates, um, this could tend towards uh, 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 precipitation and clogging. So just something to think about. Um, also, um, so towards the end of the season, this is another east side orchard, um, you know, end of the season. Uh, orchards tend to, you know, they look a little haggard. They've been through a lot, uh, drought, stress during harvest and everything. But uh, this is just leaf, the leaf sample analysis uh, collected in July and then, um, and oops, sorry. And then uh, returning, returning to that, that same orchard late, uh, late in the harvest season, you know, see uh, what, what resembles salt burn. And then sure enough, when we look back at the tissue analysis for sodium and chloride from July. Um, so this is the, this, this, Tissue analysis goes with that water report. So there's actually low levels of sodium and chloride um, at this location, but we're still seeing it accumulate in the leaves. And, and the reason for that is when we have high temperatures, high evapotranspiration, we're delivering irrigation water to a, to a shallow root zone. Um, this is going to tend towards um, uh, an accumulation of salts, um, you know, where, where we would not expect it. Um, so... Again, the, just the graph is just showing, showing some of those elevated temperatures this time uh, for the east side of Fresno County through the growing season. So um, what can we do if you have clean water in the wintertime? Uh, it, it's good to uh, institute a rec reclamation program. The good news is, is you know, with some of these areas, um, you know, uh, some of those salt accumulations may be limited to the surface if it accumulated through the season. So. If, 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 you have the, if you have the water available in season, uh, you could apply a leaching fraction, um, but probably most useful to use water uh, for reclamation in the winter time when evapotranspiration rates are low, so you can more efficiently move those salts down through the profile. And so um, this, just, this is my last slide. Um, if we had a longer to discuss, we could talk about um, you know, approaches to saving water, water budgeting, you know, if, whether you're using actual or reference ET, you know, uh, being careful with the, your uh, applied water, um, soil, uh, understanding soil moisture, understanding 
how your soil holds, uh, how much moisture your soil holds, holds what the wetting pattern is of your irrigation system. So just trying to trying to increase our precision with our irrigation scheduling. Um, there are regulated deficit irrigation approaches. Um, again, uh, make sure to to work on improving your distribution uniformity with routine maintenance. And then um, if, if you have the clean water available, uh, winter is a good time for reclamation in the root zone. And that's all I have. So thank you. Thank you, May, for your insights from the south. Now let's hear Luke from, uh, with his insights from the north of the valley. Good morning, scholars. So, I can only, of course, provide a single perspective from the Sac Valley. Again, my name is Luke Milliron, and I'm an orchard farm advisor uh, based in Butte County and also covering Glen and Tehama counties. Here we have a map showing the reports from folks about wells going dry on the on the domestic side of things, house wells. And what we see for our friends in the San Joaquin Valley that although personally I do feel that the Sac Valley is the land of, of milk and honey, it is the chosen land, um, we do have our water problems too. So it may not be uh, a great escape strategy from water problems in the south uh, to, to move operations to the north. We see here a uh, recent, so in the last month to the last year, um, a big highlight in northern Glen County and into Tehama County, really highlighting the I-5 corridor there. And then spots throughout the, the valley um, in addition to that. But again, a lot of, of new reports. This is a, you know, few weeks old now, but, but showing the incredible start we got with these precipitation index from the, um, from the foothills, from, the, from some northern uh, Sierra precipitation stations, and showing that we're, we were at that time on just a record track um, in terms of, of water. But of course, um, things really haven't, <laughs> there hasn't been much precip since then. So. Um, we, we are um, a long ways from, uh, from getting things back on track. One more thing before getting into the west side is just when you have a massive rain, a atmospheric river as we did, and you have four to six inches um, or more falling in a relatively short period of time, you are really concerned about how much of that is actually making its way into the root zone and going to be available to our trees. Alan Fulton, a retired farm advisor, a water farm advisor, you know, gives it the, the rule of thumb about 50% of precipitation um, is actually going to, going to end up being of benefit to us. And I would ponder that with climate change and with atmospheric river type events, that percentage is probably a lot lower. And I know now on the, the west side, um, not only are you in more of a, a rain shadow, so you're getting less rain, but a lot of those operations are on sloping land and you have parched soils after, after harvest, so you get a good rain and things just kind of wash off right away. Uh, your tensiometers may still be saying, I'm, I'm quite dry, thank you very much. And then Franz Niederholzer, farm advisor based in Sutter Yuba and Calusa, and runs the Nichols Soil Lab farm operation in Calusa County, notes, you know, you may have water, but very expensive water often, but how clean is it, as, as May was doing a, an excellent job really getting into. So at Nichols, for example, the, you know, excessive chloride across the board in the Ammons, but phenomenal yields this year. So are we waiting for the other shoe to drop if we don't leach those, those chloride ions this winter? Are we going to see a yield impact next year? So we're kind of, we all find ourselves in a natural experiment from hell 
and we're, we're hopefully not going to face that. It'll rain, and we won't find out um, whether the shoe's going to drop, um, but that's, that's something in the back of my mind. And again, um, that, that refilling versus water running off, how much of our rainfall is actually making it into our soils. Um, ground truthing with an auger, and if you have uh, sensors already in your soil, uh, you already hopefully have a sense of what's going on with that. I really like the approach, and Alan Fulton and I have been uh, harping on this on SacValleyOrchards.com for a number of years already, of the concept in the Sac Valley, where we do usually get some rainfall, of if in a normal rainfall year, even though that's a non-existent thing, you, can, you expect that you could refill your soil profile. If you have the water, be doing that all winter long in the absence of rainfall. So refilling the soil profile does not have to be a on or off switch. It's a decision that can be continually made. I would say every two weeks, beginning in October and through January, of looking at historically what was the rainfall should I be putting that back with some irrigation? If you know me and you've heard me speak, you probably know that I'm obsessed with the pressure chamber. And so I really also like the Ammon Board's approach to, to irrigation, that they have this irrigation continuum 1, 2, and 3.0 that builds up um, higher levels of sophistication. And we should all be working towards becoming irrigation 3.0 type folks. So at a 1.0 level, you're at least looking at the tree, saying, okay, my trees are looking a little peaky, they're looking a little bit water stressed. At a 2.0 level, you're taking some pressure chamber readings, and at a 3.0 level, you're regularly using the pressure chamber to trigger irrigations. Instead of just looking at the bars that are on the pressure chamber, you're actually taking into account bars below baseline, which is the more advanced concept, and you're using it to, to start the season and to do that whole split deficit that May reference. And I would encourage you to look at Ken Shackle's poster on start of irrigation in Ammons, a study that Roger Duncan and I are collaborating with him on. And that shows, as, as you may know, that Ammons, when they start drying out in the spring, they kind of fall off a cliff. They, it's, it happens quickly. So our initial findings, at least, would be to not really wait a very long while they start to dry out. But you see some stress start to develop with, with either your soil moisture or the pressure chamber um, to get an irrigation on, even if it's a light irrigation. But, but check out that poster. So currently in, in the industry, uh, California Ammon Sustainability Program, CASP, has done a survey and they find that almost all growers say they're at least looking at the, the trees, those visual cues of water stress. And closer to 30% are doing, working with the pressure chamber. And, and I hope that we can bring that percentage much higher up across the industry. I encourage folks to get into using the pressure chamber because it has tremendous, tremendous implications on the productivity of our orchards because it is directly measuring what we care about most, the tree. And some of my larger growers in my area report that it's only 10 to 20 bucks an acre for them to use the pressure chamber to time irrigation across their operation. Of course, that expense will be higher for smaller growers, but I would say that a pressure chamber, if you use it, is going to pay for itself even if you're only farming 80 acres. Here we see some work from Bruce Lampton in showing how powerful the pressure chamber is in the productivity of an orchard as you're establishing it in those first eight years. And what we see here is um, eight bars of stress over time, almost it's very low stress, 12 bars moderate, or 16 bars, which is really quite stressed. And what we see is that on an 80 acres, on an 80 acre farm with just four bars of stress during that canopy development stage, you will only have, you'll have less than half of the light interception 
Sebastian was doing this great job of talking about these our orchards being like this machine of photosynthesis. You are your machine is only halfway up and running if you are um, stressing it during those early years. Versus at the eight bar treatment, you're already at eighty percent, which is that goal we're looking for. So you have over four hundred thousand dollars in potential revenue loss, and that. A, a 12 bar tree, for example, may look perfectly fine with that, with our, the, the visual cue test. So measure your trees with a pressure bomb so that you're not flying blind. But of course, more water is not always the, the, the right answer. And we know that excessive water uh, close to a hole split can get us into hole rot problems. And so using that regulated deficit irrigation then. May Columber referenced uh, the lower limb dieback as, as a potential um, issue with water stress, but I would say that it's really a mysterious phenomenon still, and it may also be tied to um, to having uh, excessive water early in the season. Bruce would also note that the um, the variability that we want, well, we don't want the variability that's out there in the orchard can be reduced if things are just a little on the underwater side. So with excessive water, we always know that those smaller trees just can't get rid of the water. They can't, it's just too much for them. So they're going to suffer. Um, and so if you just under irrigate slightly, you can be working towards a more uniform orchard. So we all want that, that orchard on the right instead of the one on the left. If using the pressure chamber seems too intensive uh, on the, the human side for you um, in terms of your labor, I would encourage you to look at some of the, um, some of the automated uh, plant measures that are coming out. There's several on the market now. The one I've had experience with is Floripulse, and their technology shows good agreement with the pressure chamber, um, but I still would encourage at least having a pressure chamber because you gotta choose which, which tree to attach these expensive sensors to. And the first time I used Floripulse, I, assign, I happened to assign it to like the, the least water stress tree in the whole orchard. And so it wasn't giving a good picture. Um, so that's an important consideration. And I would just say that the, um, this, this technology is still expensive. You know, the price will come down in coming years, but we're still working out what is that cost to efficacy um, versus, uh, versus the pressure chamber. But it is really nice because it is an automated measure. And so as things happen really quickly, as I discussed, you know, the trees can kind of fall off a cliff in terms of water stress early in the year um, after leaf out as, as you head into the irrigation season. When they start to dry out, they really start to dry out fast. You can pick that up with, a, with an automated measure, whereas if you're only pressure bombing once a week, you may miss it. If you're not going to use the pressure chamber and you're not going to use an automated measure, please, 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 at, you at least use some soil moisture sensors of some kind. Again, you're going to be getting a continual uh, information. It's not measuring the tree, which is the best way to go, but at least it's a direct measure of something that's going on in your orchard and you're seeing how deep your irrigation uh, is getting, which, which of course has tremendous value as well. In terms of more resources, I would encourage you to take a look at uh, the drought management tip. Do a Google search for that. That came out in 2015 from David Dahl and Ken Shackle. That has some of the more severe um, situation, no water or very low water um, uh, type, type decision making. I would also encourage you to, to contact your, your local farm advisor. And we have a new irrigation advisor um, Kurt Pierce, based in Glen County, also covering Shasta, Tehama, um, and Calusa counties. So you can reach out to Kurt. And of course, we have SacValleyOrchards.com, and we have SJVTNV.com in the San Joaquin Valley. And you should all, you should all be listening to my fabulous podcast that I have with uh, the esteemed uh, Phoebe Gordon and Clarissa Reyes. Uh, that, that is out weekly where you can listen wherever you listen to podcasts or at Growing the Valley Podcast. 
podcastwithjeff.com. And with the podcast, we have a whole 10-part series on irrigation, which if you do a, a search for CBFA Continuing Education, you can listen to some of those episodes and then take a short quiz and get CBFA Continuing Ed credits. I would also encourage you to um, go to the, the Ammon board, uh, ammons.com forward slash irrigation site. That is that compendium and moving along that continuum so that we can all be 3.0 irrigators um, is where we should be headed. Okay, step one, we're going to pray for gentle rains. So we have 50% or more of that rain actually being of use to us. Step two is substituting irrigation for any lost rainfall and substituting for those shortfalls. Step three is using the pressure chamber or at least soil moisture for starting the season as a weekly trigger and for that regulated deficit uh, during hole split. Again, if you're not going to use the pressure chamber, um, looking at these automated technologies as well as at least adopting uh, soil moisture sensors. And then on the water quality, is that other shoe going to drop? Test your water quality at the start of the season, take leaf samples, keep up on tracking those, those chloride levels. All right, thank you folks. Thank you, Luke. Very interesting. Uh, we have time for a few questions. There is a mic right there. Uh, in the meantime, I will say uh, we have also a session tomorrow called Precision Orchard Management, which, where we're going to call irrigation. And we're going to discuss about three sensors, the sensors that Luke was showing and more sensors as well uh, from Dr. Ken Chakel and Isaiah Kisaka's work. So uh, any questions? Okay, um, so the speakers here are also going to be in our poster session. Oh, there's a question right there. Yes, go ahead. Hi, thanks for the fascinating talks. Um, I was especially interested in the last one, and um, I'm wondering if you have any experience with sap flow sensors. Are you... I, don't have... I don't have any experience with sap flow sensors, but I think it can still be... Um, you know, it can be calibrated for your orchard and situation. Um, and anything that's showing you a relative measure of when things are starting to dry out, I think is going to provide you uh, meaningful information. So for those of you who have purchased a meal ticket to today's lunch, uh, please make sure your way to ball ballroom A here on the second floor, featuring Barb's cutie Tuki, Chief Innovation and Marketing Officer for Matson, sponsored by Yosemite Farm Credit. Following lunch, we will be, have a dedicated trade show time with more than 270 exhibitors. This is the largest almond conference trade show today, so we really invite you to be there. And also during this time, we have dedicated poster sessions, so I uh, hope yep. to see you during the poster session after lunch as well. Oh, yeah, yeah, Thank yeah, you. yeah. We've, we've talked. Hi.